Welcome to the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. Yet again, we are going to be doing a trout fishing film. We're up here on the north shore of the banks of Rutland Water. But we're not just coming on our own, are we? We're going fishing with a guy. He's a professional fishing guide and a casting instructor, Rob Waddington. And he has got so many tips. I don't think I've got enough memory on the camera. And let's hope I can learn something a bit more about fly casting because for me as a beginner, it's really important that I try and get this right. So let's go inside and try and get some more tips for you guys. And Rob has a lovely big fishing vehicle. The rods are already up there, loaded up. He takes you anywhere you want. You can go boat fishing, you can go bank fishing, but I'm hoping to pick his brains, really if I can, on a bit of bank fishing, on a reservoir for beginners. And I've got to be honest, that's what me and my car. Can't wait to get in there because it's cold out here. Rob, good to see you, mate. Hello, Graham. Nice to see you, sir. Hi, Hi, Mike. Yeah. Hi, Mike. Hi, good to see you. Welcome to Rutland Water. I mean, what sort of room is this? Have I died and gone to heaven or what? This is a fisherman's paradise. This is my shed. <laughs> this, is, this, is my, this is my man cave. This yeah. is a fisherman's man yeah, cave, yeah, most yeah. definitely. My goodness, it's. Yeah, uh, and you're very welcome. It's, it's full of lots of gizmos and gadgets. Now, we're not reservoir experts. I could not write a book about it, but the little I do know, I know it's good fishing, and I know it's different to the sort of small water trout stuff we do. Some of our viewers, you know, they want to they keep emailing us, and they might, you know, all the time, yeah, reservoirs, yeah. big waters. <laughs> yeah, okay, guys, we know a lot of you fish big waters, but it's not that easy. Rob, let's sit down, let's run through, give us your history, and give us a few tips on reservoirs. Come on, then, let's have a go. Just let me tell you a little bit about what I'm doing here on Rutland Water before we start. Uh, I came down from Yorkshire about 20 years ago actually, I used to fish the River Wharf and all those lo lovely uh, ri rivers up there. And I came to Rutland and was blown away by the sheer size of this place. I had a, a little preconceived idea in my mind that it was all lure stripping for stock rainbows. But I've been doing this job now professionally teaching people and guiding people for 10 years. And believe me, it's it's quite clever fishing. It's quite interesting fishing, which we'll talk to you about. Size of water. Now, how big is this place exactly? It's a huge water. We've got 26 miles, about 26 miles of shoreline all around this lake, and it's and, and we've got about three and a half thousand, just under three and a half thousand acres of water. Big old pond. And depths. What are the depths run here? You know, from shallows to they have obviously a deep area near the dam. But what what would be sort of an average depth for bank anglers? Well, if you think of it as two, three separate parts, the north arm, the south arm, which I'll show you on the map later, the maximum depth, depth on those arms is around about the 40 feet level. But we've got a place, two couple of places up in the main basin by the dam, as you say, a little bit further in from the dam. It goes down to 110 feet deep. So it's a vast volume of water that's as huge, well. That's huge, that's a huge yeah. area, yeah. What's the catchment area of this water for? Where does it actually feed? Where does it go to? Well, it's a reservoir, totally man-made, totally artificial. It's the largest man-made lake in Western Europe, and it's for drinking water. It's run by Angling Water as a water resource, and, and the water's actually pumped in from the Neen and the Welland near Peterborough. So there's no real significant feeders, river feeders as, as such, and it's taken out and purified and then sold as drinking water all over the place. So with the bank anglers, you mentioned you've got 26 miles or so of bank. Can you physically fish all around that, or do they have some closed areas? You can fish most of it. There are a few nature reserves up at the end of the arms, lovely sort of wild areas where we're not allowed to fish from the bank. Um, we can fish it from the boat up to about 50 metres from the, from the area there. But there's still a lot, a lot of banking to fish. Absolutely. Now, let's get on the subject of, one calls it the entomology. What do you call the fishy side of it with fish fry? It's not entomology, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but, it could be, couldn't it? Yeah, but we, we need to go through exactly what, you know, the sort of history or the life cycle of the food for the trout here. You know, tell us a little bit about that. Well, the good, the good thing about Rutland Water is, is the quality of the fish. I mean, I've found that over the years. It's not necessarily the quantity that we catch, but the quality of these fish is superb. And that's because the water is so pure, there's such, such good quality water, it's full of food for the fish. The, the best way to catch the better fish, the grown on fish here on Rutland, is to imitate the food they eat. And that's what we like to do, to catch the better fish. And we've got to consider what they're eating at any particular time of the year. Okay, so now we're here in the springtime. Now I would say that possibly 
is a, is, is a good time for the number of trout being in the water. Obviously, it, it's stocked and you've got the growing on fish and you've got the stock fish going in. But are we a little bit too early for insect life or is it starting to happen now? We're here in April. Well, we're in April 2014 and as you know, we've not, we haven't had a very bad winter at all. We've still got lush weed beds out there, which we haven't had for years. And we've got amazing hatches of buzzers. So Rob, I know there's a lot of coarse fish fry in here as well, but what sort of, is, a, is a, a, a large number of insect life at this time of year? I mean, what, is there any percentage that you know, where well, it's a good chance we're going to catch on this particular natural? It's still quite warm out here at the moment, so we've got a lot of hatches of buzzers, especially when the wind dies down. And trout love buzzers. The Chironomid midge makes up about 75% of any still water trout's diet. And that's, that's just all over, all reservoirs you'd think that would be, or just Rutland? I mean, the, 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 the buzzer fishing I know is a popular method of fishing, but I mean, is that much, is, is worth copying that all the time really this time of year? I think, I think if you look at any still water in the world, you've got hatches of buzzers. And I, I would always prefer to fish buzzer, especially at this time of the year when everything's warming up. Now's the time to buzzer fish. Now what about the other, say, nymph stages? Well, run us through a few of the, the nymph stage, what I would call traditional flies that uh, trout fishermen might want to look to. Well, there's a few different imitative flies that we can use. Uh, the buzzer, I'd say, is probably the number one fly at this time of year. But we can use nymphs, which, which look like nothing in particular and everything in general. It can look like anything from little Carixa, yeah. water boatman, or the nymph stage of any sort of flies here. A good fly to use throughout the year, actually, is a little nymph. And hawthorns and stuff and other terrestrials, they all take part in their different seasons, I would guess. Yeah, we've got, we've got to look at what the fish are eating throughout the season. We've got to be aware of what's going on. Any time now, when, when the hawthorn blossom really comes out, we might get a massive hatch of hawthorn flies, and the trout might lock onto that particular food item. So we've got to be aware and, and match what the, what the fish are eating. If that happened, you know, bear in mind people watch these films all through the year, but if they're, is that a, a match to hatch, obviously, with the hawthorn, because that's what's available at the time, is that going to be on the top, or is that going to be... Sunk, sunk fly fishing, what, what's your technique for fishing a hawthorn? Well a hawthorn is a terrestrial fly so it actually is blown off the hawthorn trees and the bushes around the lake here and it might take, once it hits the water, it might take the fish a couple of days to cotton on to the idea that this is a good thing to eat. So be aware and when they do lock onto that you'll see the fish rising and take them off the top. Pure dry fly fishing. It's all dry, you wouldn't fish any sunk flies, sunk patterns for the flies that have sunk, you know, that drown and sink or anything like that? If the fish are on the hawthorn flies, you want it on the top. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, last year there wasn't a particularly great hawthorn fly, so most of the fish we caught were under the, were under the surface. Now, looking to moving through the season from, say, let's say where we are now coming up to uh, uh, hawthorn time, they don't get mayfly up here, or do they get a mayfly hatch? No, we don't. We don't well, there's one or two mayflies, but not a significant hatch here. Okay. I mean, if we take it through the season, I think at this time of the year, that April, we really want to be fishing buzzers. We want to be fishing buzzers under the surface. There are occasions when the fish will be, are taking the emerges just as the buzzers are coming, uh, they're getting stuck in the surface film. So we are getting follows and swirls to dry flies at the moment, but give it a couple of weeks and then we'll be taking dries. A little bit later on than that, probably end of May, they may be taking the little pin fry, so a little pearly pheasant tail nymph cast at rising fish might take the pin fry feeders. Now the pin fry, what are they exactly to tell beginners? Okay, well, there's absolutely stacks of coarse fish in Rutland water. It's unbelievable, the amount of shoals of bream and perch and pike and zander, everything out here, out here all happily breeding away. Now, normal circumstances and normal year, about the end of May, all the tiny little fish that they've laid will, be, will become little slivers of, of silver. We call them pin fry, tiny little things. And the fish occasionally go absolutely mad on these things. What sort of patterns would you use to imitate those? You know, or is it something you can't imitate? There are all sorts of good imitations for the little pin fry. It's not easy fishing though. These fish will, will take fry and then they'll move somewhere else. Very difficult fishing. Frustrating by the sound of it. Frustrating. Little, little pheasant tail nymph with a pearly thor thorax. Any little nymph with a bit of silver on it. I like I like the old fashioned silver invicta. It does a, does it as good as anything. Now, for people that would I say be right and say that's a sea trout fly? Would that is it an invicta or is that just a general wet fly? It's a, it's a wet fly, but the thing is, it's got a silver body. Yes. And I think that's what the fish see is that little silver, little, little line of silver there. 
Now, years ago, I used to read, obviously, it's a stamping ground of, uh, of Bob Church and his, and his crew used to catch a lot of fish up here. And I remember them popularising, really, you know, the lure fishing as such. That was sort of, as I understand it, back in fishing, sort of towards September time. You, you change from the pin fly, pin fry, and then you go larger, I suppose, do you? Absolutely, those little fish that, that were here at the end of May, by September, October, November, they're good, you know, three, four inch fish. And then we have to imitate the size of those fish with big lures, big fish looking lures, silver, white, and, and just enticing the fish. It's very exciting fishing at the back end here. Is that slow stripping or is it fast? Because, I mean, for me, lure fishing, we used to think, go to any reservoir, bang on an appetizer, throw it out and pull it back. But it's obviously a lot more refined if you want consistency and quality of fish. It's a way of winkling out yeah. the better quality fish. Yeah. Uh, don't get me wrong, Graham, the, the lures will, will catch a lot of fish. I mean, the lures is basically a flashy attractor in, in different colours, and we, we tend to pull them quite quickly across Fast, the track yeah. to get an aggressive reaction. They work, they work great. But the imitative, fly, imitative flies tend to catch the better fish. And when we're imitating, you know, the big fry, they'll be big flies, but we'll be trying to imitate the speed of the fly. So oft, quite often a little figure of eight, maybe a few pulls, just to create that... Bit of movement. Bit, bit of movement, movement like a fish. Now, when you got here, you got obviously stockfish. It's so big, some of those stockfish are going to last, hopefully, if they don't get eaten by cormorants and stuff, year after year after year, they're going to get bigger. Am I right in saying that the really dedicated reservoir angler is after those what we call overwintered fish. That's what Rutland's famous for, the overwintered fish. I tell you, if you if you get a four even a four or five pound overwintered trout, rainbow or brown trout, you you will not see a, a more beautiful specimen of fish. And hard scrappers, I imagine, too, because you've got a full a full tail. Oh, you talk about bone fish, they'll rip your line out, they'll rip fifty yards of backing easily. Big tails. Bright silver, and, I, and I, you know, if you get it, I had one yesterday. Um, it, was, it wasn't a huge fish; it was about three pounds. Silver as a bar, and, you, and it looked like a little salmon. Beautiful fish. Now, what size? Just so the guys know, here at Rutland, give us a size top end brown trout, rainbow trout. What can they grow to under wild natural conditions here? Okay. Well, to give you an idea, to put it into perspective, there are places, there are small still waters all over the country, as you know that they grow trout to huge proportions and, and put them in the lake and they're caught. This is a little bit different. These trout are stocked, they are artificially stocked. They're going in about a pound and a half up to about two and a half pounds. And then as I said, there's so much food and space out there, they grow and grow. There was a fish caught last year. It must have gone in as a brown trout. It must have gone in about two pounds, but it was caught last year, seven, just under 17 and a half 17, and that's on a fly, right? On a fly. And how old, how old a hold that fish might be? Well, they took some scale readings from it. I reckon there's about 10 years in the lake. 10 years? Mm. And this lake's been here long enough to, there could be some real clonkers out there. We, yeah, you know, there must be bigger fish than that out there. I mean, <laughs> me and my guides, and we, we've, we've brought fish up to the boat like crocodiles, and it just, it, your heart's just pounding. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have lost big fish, I have. It's, we're using heavy line as well, and sometimes they can take with such aggression that they'll just, they just don't stand a chance. There's some monsters out there. Well, that's given us good insight into the fishery. It's got me all fired up. I think we've got to take a look inside your fly box. Yeah, well, Graham, I've got thousands of flies here, probably millions of flies, but they're all set up into two different types here. We've got all the lures here and then all the Im imitation, imitations here. Now, this time of year in April, we can fish lures. We, we are fishing lures with some of these big, ugly things here. One of the best flies at this time of the year is black and green, black and green tadpole. That's it. That catches more fish at this time of the year than probably any other any other fly. But it is a lure. Now, this time of year, we've got a lot of buzzers hatching. So to catch the better fish, we can use these these buzzers here. What size hook are those? Tens or something would they be? Simple buzzer there. Well, about a ten, or does it, it doesn't really matter the size of the well, hook too much. Well, we, we really want to match the size of the fly, the size of the buzzer that the fish are taking at the moment. Um, you know, any, anything from a fourteen up to up to a ten, uh, even some twelves I'm using at the moment. Some big flies like this. This is the the larva stage of the Chironomid midge. It's like chocolate to trout. Trout always love buzzers. 
in any still water. Is that particular one or any of them weighted? Do they have like an under underwire weighting there? I don't think we need to weight them, but sometimes I do like to anchor, have maybe fish three or two or three flies on the leader, and the one at the end I'll put it, I'll put on a big hook or a big of a bit of a heavy hook. So this is when you buzz a fish, and you're going to be fishing a t what we call a team of flies. Probably fish a team of flies today, um, two or three. I don't think that things any need to go too much more than that today, but a fairly decent size, something like that, just to weight it down at the end. So what you would call sparsely dressed, I suppose, really, and it's almost a bare hook, the buzzers. Well, buzzers aren't big, big insects at all, and I think the new trend really is to use these uh, super glue buzzers, varnished, very slim, uh, to, to really look like the natural insect. And there's nothing bright there, obviously, because it has to represent a natural one. What about colours? Are there any different colours? Yeah. I see you've got different grades there. It's very interesting. Buzzers are a fascinating subject because all the buzzers start off as a little red worm in the mud, the blood worm. That's the larva stage of the chironomid midge. And then when they hatch out into the, uh, the pupa stage, we never actually know what colour is going to hatch out. Nature can kick, kick out black buzzers, brown buzzers, olive green, claret, all sorts of colours. Now we have to be aware of what the fish are eating and match that colour. Do you how, how do you how do you know? <laughs> well, you're going to come down. You, you get that thing called a marrow spoon, yeah. and somebody somebody catches one on a lure, yeah. and then they spoon it to see what the stomach contents yeah. are. So I go, he's been feeding on buzzers, I think, but it's eating a lure. <laughs> I can never work it out. Well, fish are opportunistic, spoon. aren't they? Yeah. You know, if you're eating uh, something healthily and a, and a you know and a steak came past, you're not going to you're not going to say no. Or I wouldn't anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's a various ways you can find out what colour buzzers they're, they're taking. You know, you know buzzers, they come, they seem to fly around your face anyway. You could swap one, you could have a look at the colour. Sure. I live on the lake side here, the cobwebs around the trees on my, on my wing mirrors. I can see what's been hatching because they're stuck in the, in, the, uh, in the cobwebs there. That's a totally awesome tip, guys. Go looking for cobwebs. <laughs> Never thought of that. That's, that makes sense. That makes this sense. Time of, and then this time of the year, you get so many buzzers. You might have seen this clouds, like the like the the trees are on fire. Yes. With clouds of buzzers. But if you drive those through those, it splatters on your windscreen. You can check on your windscreen as well. Tip number two: windscreens. <laughs> Although those buzzers are usually red. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I tend to, if, I, if I'm taking the fish, I will, I will spoon the fish and see what it's been feeding on. It can be very, very, very useful. This is the one that, uh, this is the one I show people. I think I got this with trout and salmon one, one year, about 20 years ago. But it's not really big enough for these fish. It doesn't reach down to the stomach. So I got, I've got one here I made earlier. I have a bit of old copper piping. That's the good stuff. Good we'll, idea. We'll pull that down the fish's mouth. We'll give it a little turn and we'll take out the stomach contents and it, it shows you what it's been feeding on and actually when it's been feeding on because if it's at the back of the stomach it's it maybe a few hours ago never thought of that ah. <laughs> never thought of that one <laughs> that's good yeah traditionally though we're, we're talking what uh, 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 just in the surface for buzzer fishing would you know the top sort of five six feet of water or something the depth of the buzzer is very important, yeah, it depends on, usually depends on the brightness of the day. Yeah. If it's a very bright sunny day, trout will tend to be taking the buzzers deep down. Trout don't like bright sunlight, they don't have, you know, peak cap or sunglasses like us, and they feel exposed in the bright sunlight. On an overcast day, they might take it, as you say, just under the surface. That's why we tend to use about two or three flies, and we can actually plumb at different depths, we can actually fish at different depths. The heavy one will be fishing deeper, and then the lighter one will be fishing higher up in the water. Now, I recall seeing uh, when we fished far more once, didn't we, Mike? We got our butts kicked big time by the local experts there, and I couldn't even see them retrieve these buzzers, buzzers you know, as we're trying to move them in. Is that a problem with people fishing buzzers? You've got to remember that buzzers don't move very quickly, and most people actually fish buzzers too, too quickly. The two ways of fishing buzzers... Um, if we cast the line out and retrieve the fly, a figure of eight retrieve. Sure. But the figure of eight re retrieve we use here on Rutland is as slow and as slow as possible, almost nothing. Ideally, if you've got a nice wind just to take the line around, just let the water do that. So the emphasis is slow when you're slow, buzzing. Slow, slow, slow buzzers. So probably the best way to fish buzzers, the most effective way to fish buzzers, is absolutely static. And one method we use to use to do this is to use an indicator on the end of the line. 
we call it the bung method. Okay, and I've yep. got, I just happen to have one here. Good, you got one to hand, that's yeah, good. Yeah, there's various, there's various types. Um, I often use a piece of wool like this tied on the, on the fly line, or you can actually make them with a bit of polystyrene here. And what I'll do is I'll have this by the fly line, and then below this I'll maybe have three buzzers, maybe at three foot, six foot, nine foot, cast it out and leave it. And then you've got buzzers hanging in the surface, hanging in the depths, the, the same way the natural would. And any trout cruising around at the, either of these three depths will see that bit of chocolate. Now I'm like open, I'm picking my jaw up off the floor because what I've just had as a sight bob is a tiny little sticky thing. And you've got something that looks awfully like a suppository. <laughs> how in God's name, how do you cast that I thing? I can't be the purest, <laughs> I'm, I'm not <laughs> doubting it works. It it it, you wouldn't have it around if it, if it didn't work. But I mean, that's really, really big. Well, when big. you get to my age, you need to see something, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Those sticky things, they're all right, but I think they tend to come off after a few casts. Yep. You know, certainly if you're playing a hard fish, it'll be, it'll be, sh it'll be shaking off. So gotcha. yeah, we tie something, put something on the line, Bit of wool is my preference. Now you can buy those, can you? Those other ones, would you make them yourself? Is it something that you can make? You can't, I don't think you can buy these, but uh, I can supply you. You can supply them. <laughs> They're very good. But they uh, presumably work, obviously. Uh, well, I think the bum is very, it's, it's a deadly method because it fishes buzzers how they really should be fished, almost static. And a little bit of ripple. It's just going to jiggle them up and down. And that. It's not the most purest method. But, but, but no, you want, if it works, it works, yeah. 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 Would I also, because we only did this on a film four days ago, it's the first time I've ever used those sight indicators, and driving home I was saying to Mike, I wonder, because when they pull it under there's a resistance, does it sort of hold the hook in there for a split second, you know, for you to lift in? Does it help you hook as one thing, rather than hinder you? I'll tell you what it does, it actually shows you how many bites you get with that you won't feel or see because this is so sensitive. There's, there's hardly any resistance to the fish on these at all. So as soon as it goes down, you want to lift into the fish. Okay. Yeah. And you can use a piece of wool as well? A piece of wool, these are my favorites because you know, when you get to my age, you need to see something. <laughs> when that's that big, down, that's big, that's big. When that goes down, it's like the sun going in. <laughs> 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 or a piece of wool like this, very sensitive. That's brilliant. Now, something just occurred to me and again, because I don't fish reservoirs, it's probably from years ago, you talked about the sunlight level effect in the buzzers, but what about Daphnia? I've heard that. Now, is that a, is that a summer thing, the Daphnia? Daphnia's here all the time. Most big reservoirs have a lot of Daphnia. Fascinating subject. Daphnia is a tiny little water flea about the size of a pinhead. It comes in its bazillions, millions, absolutely like a cloud of, of plankton. Trout love Daphnia. They love it because it's easy food. They can just graze through it with their mouths open and just gorging on the Daphnia. So what we need to do is this. First of all, we need to establish how deep the Daphnia is. Daphnia reacts to light. So on a bright day, it's down deeper in the water. On an overcast day, it's higher up near the water. And the fish are at the same level. On a, on a, day, on a bright day down here, on an on a overcast day up here. I've got a selection of fly lines with different sinking properties. Sure. All the way from floating to a slow intermediate, medium, fast intermediate. Fly, fly lines that we call die threes, die fives, die sevens, all at different sinking levels. Establish the right line to get that band of Daphnia. And then we just rip something big and ugly through the Daphnia. Really? <laughs> you've heard of the blobs? Oh, well, you've just shown me the suppository. I want to see what the big and ugly is. <laughs> are, these, are these big and ugly for, enough for Oh, you? my goodness me. So basically, if we rip something like this through the, through the right level, as fast as we can, and I'm really talking fast. You've seen competition anglers pulling, yes. pulling lines like as fast as, as fast as we can. Well, it's like us having vegetable soup for dinner, these trout eating the daphne. It's like us having vegetable soup, you know, it's all right. It's filling. But you see a meat pie coming through past you, you're going to grab it, yeah? So, and that's what these are. This is the meat pie fly. Really? Yeah. <laughs> that's what we call that, meat pie fly. And it works. And it and does the work, the takes yeah. are so aggressive, because it's whizzing past the, the fish's face, fish's mouth, as you're pulling it fast. It's got to really have it on it, and you get absolutely really good slamming takes, takes on it. Slamming yeah. takes, yeah. That, you can use it off the bank or not really? Is it a boat thing? Yeah, the Daphne is usually out in the open water. 
you don't tend to get a lot of daphne around the edges um, so off from the bank we're looking at the weed the, the insects in the weed buzzers Carixa, the water boatman um, little shrimps we've got out here also well the natural things, insects are called them I suppose yeah, really, yeah. Insects, yeah. okay now moving on to the seasons we're getting through the year now coming towards September time those fry are going to be the uh, little pin fry you were talking about they're going to be getting bigger one assumes yeah. and for me fry feeding that I used to read about is September time mm -hmm. what patterns would you be imitating then yeah well we, we're going to imitate fish and you know I've got plenty here those little those little pin fry feeders could be three or four inches by then so we need to imitate them something like perch fry here and that's why you've got the bands marking it yeah. to, for the size perch of the perch yeah one of the best flies to use I'd say from September onwards is a minky now I've heard of those never used them this is a minky it's called a minky because it's basically it's got a strip of mink fur along the body there. It's even got the hide, the cured hide, still on, on the skin here. Attached to it, yeah. Yeah. So at the moment that's fairly lifeless, but when you get that wet, waterlogged, it becomes as soft as a chamois leather, and it wiggles, wiggles. It looks more like a fish than a fish. Very good fly, a minky. Another thing that happens during fry time in the back end of the year is you tend to get all these fry the little baby fish hiding in the weed beds hiding against the predators the seagulls and the trout and so on but occasionally the trout will, will hunt and they'll attack the fry, the fry shoals and it, you'll see it the, the water's boiling of the fish f chasing the fry and the seagulls diving hitting the fry from, from, from above they don't eat all these fry a lot of the little fish get stunned or they die and they get and they float to the surface and just float away in the current and the big fish are just are laying just off the weed beds to snaffle these floating fry off the surface. Really? So it's visual? Oh, it's so exciting. You can almost swear that they growl when they take these fry. <laughs> you just, the, the water explodes. So to imitate that, we've, de we've developed a fly called a floating fry. Now, what we do is we wrap, we, we lay deer hair, natural deer hair on a long hook bind it in with fly tying thread, thread and that makes the the deer hair splay out like a big hedgehog yeah and we trim it with scissors we can draw on it put a little eye on it and then you end up with so i've got a better there and the deer hair is very buoyant what makes it so buoyant yeah each follicle of deer hair is hollow like a tube so it traps air in there so it's a very buoyant fly it's almost essential when the fish are really locking on to a particular species to actually imitate the stunned fry of a particular species of coarse fish. Like this one here, we've got some stripes, felt pen stripes on here to imitate a perch. If you notice the eyes on the, the side of the fly, so it looks like a fish on its side. Oh, I see, so it, it really is matching the... Uh, Bit of a marabou tail. Matching the pattern, there. yeah. So just, just cast that out, let the wave do the work, leave it there, give it a few pulls now and again. And I don't know if you can see that, if you, if you turn it just sideways, so you can actually see like a dorsal fin there, isn't it? Yeah. A little dorsal fin. Yeah. And then also we've developed these new little mylar floating fries. A couple of years ago we had, a, we had a lot of sticklebacks in the weed beds, tiny little fish like this. And this is very exciting fishing with these. So you've basically got to keep an eye on what's happening on the water all the time. I think that's the key, you know, absolutely the key. You could go out there and fish and you might not catch anything for days. But if you're in the know or you know what's going on, be aware of what the fish are doing, you'll catch fish. And these reservoirs are like that, you know, you can, you can strip lures and catch fish. But you can, you can also get into it more, uh, more deeply and catch better fish by using the more imitative methods. So what, we've gone right through the flies now, it's given us a good uh, breakdown of the fishery itself. What about uh, an average fly rod reel, try and you know, talk us through a setup from the rod, reel, line and leader, you know, for a guy bank fishing. If I'm fishing off the boat, I tend to use a longer rod, 10 foot for six or seven again, seven weight, and I find that's fine for everything. There is a trend now to go lighter on the rods on reservoirs and fish more imitatively. So I might even fish with a five weight or a six weight rod. What about floating line, sinking line, forward taper, double taper, just run us through something okay. like that. 
Well, we don't want to get too technical about it, but we tend to use weight forward lines. It helps to load the rod quickly and, and enables us to get a decent cast out. Perfect for the beginners that I teach, and in fact everybody from, from uh, novices to advanced anglers these days use some form of weight forward line. It helps to get the line out there. At this time of the year from the bank, I would just use a floating line. Uh, the fish aren't deep, they're not very far away from the bank either, so a floating line is perfect. However, if I'm fishing from the boat, then we might have some depths which hold fish. So I've got a whole set selection of lines at different uh, sinking rates with me on the boat. Do you change spools or do you like take two or three rods? I, I have a, a cassette system of reels so I can just quickly take one line off and, and slam in another as quick as I possibly can. I don't want to lose any time fishing. Yeah, none of us do. We watch, it's time on the water that counts. It's the fly in the water yeah, that counts. Yeah. And I, even, after, even after a lifetime of fly fishing and 10 years doing it professionally, I get so excited catching the fish anyway. The, the lead is very important. Yeah, we've got very, very clear water on Rutland Moor. Very, very clear water. We don't want the fish to see this. We don't want the fish to see this leader. So invariably, 90% of the time, I tend to use fluorocarbon leader has the same refractive index as water, so basically it's invisible in water. And it's also heavier than water, so it'll cut down through the surface tension, so we don't get any lines where the line is... Hanging, as it were, on the surface film. It could spook the fish. Those lines could spook the fish, so it cuts down through the, through the water tension. There are times when we need a very long leader to get to, to fish at a, at a depth on a floating line to let the fly sink, sink low. But I think uh, if, if, we, if we're using about 18 foot maximum is, is fine. That's still long though, for, or I think that's long, yeah. yeah. For, for us we use yeah. nine. <laughs> yeah. if, yeah. we, if we used 18 feet we'd have nothing left on the spool. <laughs> well we can use a bit less today. Okay, <laughs> good. save money. No money. My no granddad said money saved is money earned. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not as critical on, on yeah. in April. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a few stock fish about, it's not as critical. We hope so. Yeah. Okay, well that's given us good coverage and it's an amazing room you've got here, there's no question of that. Uh -huh. One assumes you do a bit of fly tying here to show people as well? Yeah, I do uh, tie a lot of my own flies. Um, I've got a team of guides who are very good fly tires as well that help me. Um, and a little dicky bird told me you had a sailfish on a fly recently oh. from an old stamping ground of mine. <laughs> oh, the best adrenaline hit I've ever had in my life that was. Um, yeah, nice sailfish on the fly uh, from Kenya. Stay at Hemingway's. Uh, I know, yeah. I absolutely loved it. And, and I wouldn't do anything else from now. If I, I went again, I'd just do the fly. It's ruined you. It's ruined it's you. It's ruined me ruin for anything, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Oh, yeah. that's great. Well, listen, we want you to ruin, if not me, we want you to do sort Mike's casting out and ruin him totally for fishing. So <laughs> yeah, he, we can do that. he doesn't go to a small trout water again. He says, oh, Dad, I don't want to go to a, one of these reservoirs and see if we can't luck out and maybe we you have know, three of us have a go see if we can't hey. see at least one of these overwinter ones would be nice i know be lucky but okay. would well, be we'll nice to see best, you know but you know fishing's fishing well, absolutely. It, was easy, it would be called catching you yeah know? so yeah. you never know from one day to the next but i'm reasonably hopeful uh, it's a bit of a breeze out there now so we, you, you've got a couple of spots in mind have you yeah it's quite a, it's, it's getting quite strong the breeze now isn't it you can see it from the from the fishing cabin here but uh, we're going to find a little bit of shelter I think we need a, the wind at our back so we can get a decent cast out. There's a few little places I know where there should be some fish. Well, listen, Rob, I appreciate your help and a lot of totally awesome tips in there for the guys. Certainly the fly guys, I imagine, are glued to it and give them a, ideas is what the people need. You know, you need to be able to adapt, you need to be able to change and, you know, keep in the flow of all the fishing tips, techniques. They could all help you get that extra fish. That's enough fishing talk. Let's get out there, see if we can't catch something. Sounds good to me. he's the guide and we're the client what was that third cast or something 
Hey? Second cast. Second cast. Oh dear. I feel so sorry. Oh, <laughs> yeah, but I, I had a pull on the first cast and it annoyed I missed it. Really? <laughs> yeah. It's a rainbow from Rutland, I guess. It's not a brown, is it? It'd be a rainbow, yeah? It's a rainbow, yeah. Now, this would be first year stocking one, would it, this one, you think? So this is a recent stocker. You can tell it's, it's pulling hard, but not as hard as you'd expect a, a bigger one or a grown-on one. And I can tell by the colour of it, it's not as bright silver. But still, yeah, look at it, pulling, it's lovely. This fish going well, yeah. yeah. So what uh, what flying everything there? Is... Uh, a large buzzer, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the old favourite, the black and green tadpole, on a floating line. And quite fast, that one? No, very slow, let it sink a little bit and then just figure of ate it back. Get in there. There we go! Success in every packet. <laughs> That's what we want. And this, what is the target on that? Well, that would be that bit of green I can see on that lure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, funny little Rutland rainbow. Nice fish. Yeah. Let's get him in first. At least I've hooked one. That's a brownie. It was a brownie. Yeah. We looked at it earlier on and said, Woo! We said it was a brownie. <laughs> wow. That's a result for your first fish at Rutland. Well done. Well Thank done. Thank you. <laughs> well done. Brilliant. What a fish. Yeah. But that move made that move made the difference. Rob, what? Yeah. Two, two, three hundred yards, you said yeah, move. Yeah, can do. You know, this time of the year they're all shoaled up in certain little places. And if you're on them, you're on them. And if you're not, you yeah. need it. That is brilliant. And we see that is, say me again, that fly tadpole, you say? Yeah. Yeah, we can put the browns back because they're a hardier, they're a hardier fish, so. Hold them up, mate, that's a nice fish. What sort of take? Um, quite a slow, not, not yeah, it wasn't a slamming slow, take, but when it was on the hook, it was good. Good scrapper, though. Yeah, really good. I see what you mean, Rob, they're really okay. silver, aren't they? Yeah. And you can see that well, spade when of the that's tail. Well, been in a long, uh, you know, a bit, bit longer. That'll be, that'll really silver up. A healthy tail. You can't tell the difference be. between one of those and a, and a sea trout when they're when they've grown on a bit. I'll be a fly back there, Mike. Yeah. I bet it'll go. Lovely. Lovely. Look at that go. Well, Rob, that really is totally awesome fishing. Uh, well done. Well <laughs> Thanks done. very much. Well done. <laughs> I want one now. <laughs> yeah. Hey, well done, Mike, but Thanks. you're not going home yet. Let's try and get right. his granddad. Oh, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Brilliant. I can't believe I've gone down. I've cast out. I haven't even stripped the line, and he's on again. That's a bad fish. fish. Be nice careful. Fish. Yeah, I can feel it. Thicker. Heavier in the rod. If you play them fairly hard, they'll fight back harder. Yeah. Oh, I want to see a real screamer. <laughs> Oh, oh I thought he was gone then. Let him, let him go if he does that. Yeah, let him, yeah. Let him take line. Very easy to go from hero to zero by clamping. Yeah. That's oh, it. that marking you said on your line? Yeah. I just saw it come through there. That might be the granddad we were talking about. Oh, I hope so. He's going towards us. <laughs> I want to ask him again what his retrieve was. It's a bit embarrassing, isn't it? I said, I'm begging for him. Please tell What's me. Please little, tell me. Stuff. Is it really? It's, it's bloody going good. well. Yeah. Imagine good. what it's like when you get a big one. Yeah. <laughs> hey, number two. Another brownie, that's right. Like, yeah, we've got a pod of brownies. Another, it's another brown, another is it? Brownie. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, Cormorant's just had a little go at it. Look. There's another trout on the black and green tadpole, a fly I've never used before, and he's, he's got that quite well. There's the fly. It certainly worked, three it in a row. It certainly works, yeah, and here's the trout to prove it. Hold him up for a picture with the camera. Yeah, lovely markings. They're like and a baby salmon, aren't they? Beautiful. Up like a baby salmon. What a fish. 
And slim. Yeah. That's the other thing slim, I noticed. A nice slim big looking old fish. tail on them. Yeah, look at the tail. That's the difference where they get the power. Yeah. Let's get this one back. Lovely clear water here as well at Rutland. Look at that. Whoa. Another fish. Certainly brought us to the right spot, Rob. <laughs> now I'll rephrase that. You and Michael are certainly fishing in the right spot. <laughs> we'll get you sorted in a minute, guys. <laughs> there we go. It's just nice to see some fish, yes. you know, coming out when you talk about it and you show the techniques and come and, you know, put it into practice. It's nice. Bending rods, smiling faces. Ooh. So I can see why they fight hard, don't they? They do scrap well. Yeah. Even like early in the season like this, I can see why why you don't need the boat, do you? You know? Not this time of the year, no. in April, you you're far better off the van type thing. It's a little rainbow. Lovely. Here he comes. Get in. There we go. a little rainbow. And it's got a high degree of silver on them compared with, the, you know, if we fish a lot of the small waters. Well, actually, Graham, um, Look, it's beautiful you, silver. See, you see the, uh, the, the magenta stripe down there? Yeah. When that fish has been in uh, a wee while longer, it'll lose that and it will go really silver. Is that right, really? Yeah, beautiful silver. But not bad, eh? That's a lovely looking not fish. Bad. One thing about the rocks on here, it's quite bad walking, but it's also bad for your fly line. And to, a little tip to stop it stagging up, just pop your net on the on the floor in front of you, onto the rocks in front of you. As you're retrieving your line, all the line will fall on the net and it shouldn't snag up on the rocks. a team of buzzers now. Oh. I'm going <laughs> yeah. to... And missing trout because you're filming. Trout, yeah. So the retrieve on your fishing buzz is really slow. We'll just have another cast and we'll show you the sort of speed of retrieve. Okay well we've been fishing a while and it's the weather's got warmer. I can really tell it's got warmer. There's buzzers flying around I can see them so I've changed to a team of buzzers. I've cast about 25 yards out there and I'm retrieving very very slowly. A little figure of eight retrieve. Take's gonna be what a bump or a snatch. What sort of take would you get like that? A bit like that. Oh. A bit like that one. You missed. <laughs> but so you should strike these as well. Trying to say, or? I'm trying to. I'm just kind of lifting into it. You lift into them, yeah. 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 But there seems to be some fish holding about the 25 yard mark out there. I'm getting ever so many pulls and takes. That's the sort of speed of the retrieve. Almost nothing. Fish, it is indeed, it's only taken me 734 casts to get this one and had my butt kicked by not only the guy but my son. But I'm at long last hooked up. We've come up in a bit of a howling wind and it's paid dividends. We've seen them jumping and it just shows to show, it goes to show, you know, if you do just, well, we've moved 40 yards, 30 yards, 
It made the difference. Well, for me anyway, but it's not in the net yet. And it's a rainbow. They do dig, as they say. I deserve this one. Please don't fall off. <laughs> I've done a lot of filming for this one. There you go, Graham. For sure. Well done, sir. Well done, Lama. <laughs> I was beginning to think that you purposely snipped the fly off. Look, it's falling out. There you are. That's the reason. That's the reason. <laughs> it's falling out of the net. <laughs> I'd like to call those browns a my cat. You know, really nice. He's got, got three browns in a row, but a lovely looking fish. Look at the quality of that fish. Beautiful little fish. Great scrapper. Well worth the drive around the M25. The downside is, we've got to go back, Friday night traffic, who cares? With everybody now having caught a few fish, it's time to relax, maybe have some lunch, a snack, or in the case of the fishing guide, you can actually eat some flies. Oh yeah, that was tasty. After a nice tasty snack of buzzers, and Montana Nymphs, our guide, took us off to the other side of the peninsula to try and find a little bit of fishing on the opposite side, hopefully out of the wind. Well, Rob, we've just come around that peninsula. Uh, instantly, there's n the, the wind's just died down here, and I can see the clarity of the water is much better here. Well, why is that? Well, you've got lots of little gravel bank here, Mike. It's, yep. There's no mud here, it's lovely to wade on. And then it just dips down to some deep water over there. There should be some weed beds still underneath. You can just see... You can see, a of, with the glasses yeah. on, yeah, the photos, you can so see we, it dark. We've come here because hopefully we can catch some of the big overwintered trout. Yeah. We might not catch many, but if we can catch just nice. one, it would be a bonus. It would be nice. Bonus. Well, I'm into a fish here, about five minutes into fishing on the other side of the peninsula, and I think it could be, looks like my first Rutland rainbow this time. <laughs> it's a bit better fish, I it's think. It's a better fish, definitely, than the brownies. Yeah, it is nice. Yes. Good in, good in, well done. Brilliant. That's a better fish. Well done, mate. First Rutland rainbow, Thank hey, you. well done. Thanks so <laughs> much. What a day! <laughs> oh, there we go. Lovely Rutland rainbow. Good fish. Good fish. Healthy looking fish. And what sort of take? What did that give you? Uh, aggressive. Really? Yeah, definitely an aggressive take on that one. He slammed it. And a good run. Yeah, good run. He went up against the wind. Really good take. Well, we finished off as it started with the top professional guy, Rob, hooking yet another fish. So we'd hooked up fish, trout from both sides of this peninsula. Just goes to show you, just keep moving, get those fish. What a great session that turned out to be. Well, folks, we had a fantastic afternoon's fishing. I have to emphasize an afternoon because we spent the morning driving up the M25 and interviewing our good man, Rob, with a load of information that I know you people are going to want. So if you think what we caught in an afternoon with him, can you imagine what you catch with no wind on a good day?
Rob, mate, thank you very much. Brilliant. I certainly enjoyed it. Been a pleasure, Graham. Well, Thanks very much. Cheers. Good stuff. Next time, come on a boat. Well, yeah. let's get a boat out there. It, the bank fishing was good. We saw other guys catching fish as well. You yeah. Know? You know, not the greatest conditions. We had that fight in that wind a little bit, but you came out with a good, so... And it got a bit chilly, didn't it? The bit different, had, did, yeah. Yeah. But we did all right. Yeah. Did well, well folks didn't know, Mike had a huge fish falling right, uh, right into the bank. Right at the end. Right, right, right into right, the right, margin right. area. Right, right, no, right, it's true. Huge. It's, it's true. true. Yeah, it was a big one. Between his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, it was big. So don't forget, watch the Totally Awesome Fishing Show, and if you're ever up in this neck of the woods, do call Rob up because, I mean, it's worth going out with a guy. We had no idea where we're going. It's an enormous water. Give it a go. You'll have some totally awesome trout fishing. Watch us next time.